welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian O. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Mila Sahoni, Professor of Law at the University of San Diego School of Law. We will discuss her article, The Trump Administration and the Law of the Lochner Era, which was published in the Georgetown Law Journal. So welcome to the show, Mila. Thank you, Brian. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, no, I'm glad to have you. I, I really thought this paper was was fascinating, especially because I have a scholarly interest in the Lochner era as well. And it's been interesting to see how much it's been kind of Lochner and the Lochner era have been coming back into scholarship lately. So maybe we can talk about that phenomenon a little bit later in, in the podcast. But I was wondering if you could start by explaining to listeners who might not be that familiar with um, Lochner and the Lochner era exactly what it was. Sort of what were the span of years that we might refer to as the Lochner era? And how is it generally kind of characterized from a kind of a political or ideological sense? Sure. Um so the, the Lochner era was the period of time that extended from um, the late 1880s through the late 1930s. And historians um, quibble about both ends, well, I shouldn't say quibble, they argue about both ends of those uh, of that time span. Um, but that's, that's roughly the, the frame of time that we're talking about. Um, the Lochner era gets its name from the case of Lochner v. New York, um, which was a case in which the court invalidated um, a New York law uh, that imposed a maximum number of working hours. Um, and the baker in that case uh, was, uh, was convicted for violating that law, and the, the court held that law was unconstitutional. So that, that case um, became famous because it was a case in which the court held that the 14th Amendment's due process clause um, rendered unconstitutional, that kind of restriction on liberty of contract. Um, and there are other cases also from that period of time that uh, in which the court famously, infamously um, restricted uh, uh, legislation that um, imposed limitations on liberty of contract. So you know, minimum wage laws are another famous example. Um, in Pierce v. Society of Sisters, the court held that private schools um, had a right to property right to continue to sell education um, and, uh, and that it would be unlawful to, to outlaw them. Um, so those are the most famous parts of Lochner era law. Um, and part of what I try to do in this paper is explain that those decisions are just the tip of a bigger iceberg um, that, that we're not, um, that generally observers and scholars or observers of the Lochner era court aren't that uh, familiar with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, so one thing that struck me, has always struck me, and sort of I was thinking about it again while I was reading your paper, was that, you know, Lochner v. New York was one Supreme Court case that kind of fell right pretty much smack dab in the middle of the period that sort of you've identified as sort of the, the kind of best definition of, of the Lochner era. So why Lochner, right? Like why did Loch, why do you think Lochner came to be the case that sort of was a stand-in or kind of a, uh, a, a, came to be the name of that period? Was there something unique about it? I mean, it, you know, historically it's come to be this kind of anti-canon bet noir of constitutional law on, on both sides of the aisle, really. Um, what was it about Lochner that made it so significant, do you think? So I think that Lochner itself had a, had a sort of slow rise to fame or infamy. Um, I think Jamal Green um, wrote about this really well in his, um, in his article that you, you kind of just referred to the, on the anti-canon. Um, you know, it, 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 it became associated with uh, this broader way of thinking about the law, later scholars and justices uh, cast Lochner as being typical of that era's jurisprudence, and that's why we have the iconic anti-canonical Lochner that we have today. Okay, so I, that, that, I, that's really interesting because it totally ties in to me with 
what I took to be like the kind of key point you were making in, or at least one of the key points you're making in the first section of your paper, where you really go out of your way to point to a range of other Supreme Court cases during the period that also articulated really important principles that in many respects seem quite different from the underlying principles taken to be sort of emblematic or paradigmatic of the Lochner case. Is, is that a fair assessment of what you're, what you're trying to do there? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think that it is uh, a mistake to think of the Lochner case as being uh, just this one thing that happened in isolation and to reduce that entire era's jurisprudence into the Lochner case um, and to assume that just because something was wrong with Lochner, everything else from that era of law ha is somehow in bad order as well. Um, the Lochner era, the Lochner decision um, was one piece of the court's broader uh, uh, decision making, and uh, and a lot of the other elements of. Uh, doctrine that the court developed in that period are still part of our law uh, today. Yeah. So, I mean, Lochner's often taken as sort of reflecting this like profoundly laissez-faire, almost like proto-libertarian judicial ethos. Um, but what was really interesting to me was like, you point to a bunch of other Supreme Court decisions from the period that just seem totally inconsistent with that characterization of the court's jurisprudence at that point in time. I, I wonder if you could point to a few examples that really kind of illustrate how this unitary conception of judicial ideology during that period is not reflective of what was actually taking place. Yeah, sure. So. So Wagner is infamous because it, it recognized this economic liberty uh, of contract and housed that in the 14th Amendment. And that, you know, that economic liberty jurisprudence was uh, used against both state laws and federal laws. And it implied this idea of constitutional rights and of law uh, in which uh, government power would be extremely limited and individual liberty uh, would be correspondingly great. But in other areas of law, in particular in the realms of immigration and in foreign trade, um, the court's jurisprudence had the opposite shape. So the court in this period, um, through the immigration cases, um, with the Chinese exclusion case and, and other cases in that line, recognized vast power in the federal government to, uh, to regulate um, immigration uh, and uh, to provide for deportation uh, and for summary proceedings for exclusion. Um, and it, it gave us the plenary power doctrine in immigration law. Um, on the, in the realm of trade, the foreign trade, the court in this period upheld vast government power uh, in, uh, and in particular executive branch power to impose uh, tariffs uh, and to restrict the entry of goods from abroad. Um, so in, the, in these foreign facing realms of immigration and trade, the Lochner era court adopted a view of individual rights and of government power that was exactly the inverse of its view of those concepts in the, do, in the domestic realm. Uh, instead of uh, embracing individual rights and suppressing government power, the court in the immigration and trade realms expanded government power and limited individual rights. Um, and this was, this is the full picture of, of Lochner era law. It's a, a type of law in which uh, individual rights domestically uh, are, are great and government power domestically is cabined and restrained. But as soon as you get to the water's edge and are dealing with matters of immigration and trade, uh, the government has has plenary authority. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt like you were consistently sort of identifying almost these dialectics in jurisprudential or 
ideological approach, depending on the sphere in which the government was acting. Like there was sort of like this differentiation between between private and personal and public and governmental and between kind of domestic power and and foreign power and how the court would conceptualize the government's ability to act kind of almost diametrically differently in those kind of dialectically related circumstances. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a, a good way to think about it. I mean, the, the, the idea of um, there being these different spheres with different boundaries um, was... Uh, was a kind of animating underlying idea of of many of these doctrines and cases. Um, you know, the up the upshot of it all was that you you had disparate patterns of government power depending in what sphere you were operating. It, the Lochner era court, um, despite what it is infamous for, uh, did not always curb uh, governmental power. Um, Instead, the, the jurisprudence here had these two countervailing impulses depending on the type of government power uh, at issue. Domestically, uh, it would curb it, but, it would, but in contrast, in the, in the realm of uh, immigration and in foreign trade, uh, the government would have uh, vast power and, uh, and national sovereignty was, um, uh, was uh, plenary. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, so then in... In the second kind of half, as a or second third maybe of the paper, you shift your perspective to look at the current Trump administration and point to certain analogies or kind of similarities between the sort of practical on the ground approaches that the Trump administration has been taking to certain uh, questions of government authority and when regulation is, um, you know, desirable or not, and kind of point to ways in which it rhymes with or seems to resemble in some ways uh, the decisions that were being made during the Lochner era. And I wonder if you could just, you know, point to a few of the kind of clearest, most, um, <laughs> mo most kind of paradigmatic uh, similarities that you identified. Yeah. So, so this administration um, has embraced ideas that uh, are, have not been um, always consistently associated with one party or the other. So, it has, it has embraced these small government laissez-faire tenets um, in, in uh, its attitude towards federal law and federal regulation. And you can see that with respect to its stance uh, towards the Affordable Care Act and towards uh, net neutrality, uh, towards deregulation, generally the deconstruction of the administrative state. Um, so that's its domestic facing agenda. With respect to the foreign realm, in contrast, uh, the the Trump administration has embraced a big big government view, a, a, the, a, a view of nationalism and of protectionism, uh, and you can see that through the administration's embrace of uh, tariffs, uh, and most uh, notably, of course, in its stance towards uh, immigration, uh, where you know, it has emphasized uh, plenary power and unlimited power to, uh, to deport, exclude, uh, and, uh, and, and alter immigration rules. So this, uh, this juxtaposition, this combination of small government laissez-faire on the one hand, but extremely big government nationalist and protectionist ideals on the other, uh, is, I argue in the paper, consonant with the view of government and of rights and of sovereignty that was uh, articulated by the Lochner era court. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, what, one thing that struck me about that comparison was that, you know, of course the, the Lochner era is a way of talking about a period 
like a long period of Supreme Court history and sort of characterizing the sort of general tenor of the court over that period of time. Whereas, of course, when we talk about the Trump administration, we're talking about a executive administration that's relatively young as of yet, right? We're what, three years, three years in or something like that. Oh God, you know, it feels like we're, <laughs> but, um, but, but, you know, I, I, I wonder about, I wonder about that, about, you know, the differences in terms of the sort of the branch of government that you're talking about. And, and I, I, I totally get that, right. You're, you're talking about sort of a broader ideological perspective, but, but I guess part of me can't help but wonder, I mean, is this like, an indication of sort of the like a potential longer term bigger picture institutional shift or desired shift on the part of the current administration or sort of like how how do you how do you find that as a you know as you were working on the paper and researching the paper how did you find the you know how how did you find that analogy between the judicial branch and the executive branch in the longer period of time and the shorter yeah, that's that is a, a difficult thing to think through. Um, so the way that I think of it is this: like, if back in um, the nineteen thirties, uh, you, know, you had said to somebody, "Look, you're just casting a vote for Roosevelt. You know, you're not casting a vote for a broader ideological commitment or a broader shift in the tenor of the law." You know, they 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 might have believed you, you know, and thought that that is, uh, you know, I, I, like, I like this president, I like this president's policies. But now, you know, at this end of history, if, if I, if I, you know, if I were to say, well, the New Deal, that was just a political plan that was propelled by a particular president at a particular point in time. Um, and all that happened during the New Deal was there was a you know, political agenda that was implemented by a president and it had nothing to do with, with law, you know, then you, know, you, would, you would say, well, that is not a full description. That's a deeply inadequate way uh, of thinking about what the New Deal was. Uh, you know, it, was a, it was a shift in law as well as a shift in uh, various uh, regulatory and, and statutory and policy instruments. Um, and and what I uh, what I uh, discuss in this paper is that you know, this administration's embrace of Lochnerism is best understood as an effort to push back against the the, the law that has built up that has uh, the topsoil of law that has built up since the New Deal and to return American law and government back to its pre New Deal. Um, formulation, which is to say to the arrangements of power and of rights uh, that existed during the Lochner era. Right, right. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense that there's, you know, we are talking about a bigger ideological shift, or at least efforts to make a bigger ideological shift in the way that we can kind of retrospectively see have, having happened in in the past. I mean, I, I, I wonder, though, it's like, when I think about the Trump administration, I, I guess, at least at this point, I feel like there's something very ad hoc-ish about a lot of the policy choices that are being made. And I wonder, when you look back to the Lochner era, and you point to these kind of interesting contradictions and, and dialectics, in the policy choices that were made by the court back back then, um, do you think that some of that was motivated by a form of ad hocism as well, or did it reflect a deeper, more coherent ideological position? So, okay, so on the Lochner era uh, court's jurisprudence, um, I think that you know in the work of I draw on the work of scholars like Peter Schuck and um, mm -hmm. Duncan Kennedy. And the, the, the way that they can conceive of it is that the Lochner era courts saw the individual and the state as essentially possessing the same at attributes of absolute sovereignty. So 
you know, it, just as the individual had the right to exclude people from their property and to, you know, to maintain this sphere of individual autonomy, so did the, the, the government as a whole, the federal government, have property rights in the dominion of the nation as a whole. Um, and if you, see, if you see this kind of fractal relationship uh, between the individual and the state, you can see how it would be that a court that was deeply committed to preserving property rights at the individual level would likewise be committed to um, a robust view of national sovereignty at the scale of the nation. Um, and I, I, to me, that is the, um, th that kind of clicked a light on for me when I, when I thought of it that way, um, as the individual essentially possessing attributes that the state possessed and vice versa. So that, that just goes though to say, you know, why it is that the Lochner era court, um, could be seen as coherent. Uh, the challenge is much greater. Uh, looking, uh, looking at this administration's various uh, policies, uh, because the the you know the, the evident chaos in um, uh, in Washington right now with you know, different cabinet secretaries coming and going and so on, um, all of the court challenges, you know, it, it it doesn't really lend itself to the notion that uh, there's a there's a there's a big game plan there, um, but but I think that that superficial um, you know, chaos or lack of organization uh, is, uh, is something that we shouldn't be too uh, distracted by. Um, I think that underneath it, there is, there is a, a perceptible uh, vision of law and government and rights. And it is not with entire consistency, but it is being advanced through various uh, various policy measures and uh, through you know, the, the uh, efforts by the administration to get Congress to uh, enact legislation and, and uh, through executive branch actions uh, that can be taken without Congress's help as well. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense that there's like, especially when it comes to the Lochner era, that there could have been like a sort of big picture animating set of ideological principles that might not like absolutely determine the outcome of every decision, but at least that kind of like on a deep level inform the decision-making process and kind of provide a general trajectory to where the decisions were, were going to go. Do, do, do you think it's, it, it, do you think that something like that is happening today in the Trump administration in the sense that there's sort of a set of underlying assumptions that, you know, may not always end up going in quite the direction you predict them to, but nonetheless are sort of generally heading in one direction. I mean, I, I think that the administration has been candid about its, uh, its interest in deconstructing the administrative state. And uh, through the person of Stephen Miller, we see um, a very, very strong view of uh, the plenary power um, and uh, nationalism. The, you know, the the on the trade side, the um, I I can't think of his name, but you know, there's there are officials who uh, within the administration who uh, clearly believe that this um, policy of protectionism is going to be uh, fruitful. Um, and so you see, you see um, various arms of the executive branch or various members of it um, articulating pieces of this vision. Um, and I think if when you put it all together, you you get you get you get a picture of law and government that uh, is uh, is is not a new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so so you draw a lot of provocative analogies between this sort of big picture ideology of the Lochner era and a lot of the kind of big picture decisions that are being made today. Do you see any discontinu discontinuities as well? And, and if so, do they mean anything? Should they tell us anything? Um, how, should we, how should we look at differences as well as these kind of glaring similarities? <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I try to be, um, uh, candid about this at the outset. You know, it's, it's the, 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 the Trump administration, um, has not embraced the holding of Lochner, right? Uh, so I, I, I draw this, I write this whole paper about the Trump administration and the, and the law of the Lochner era, but Lochner itself, um, you know, was a, was a holding that would strike down, um, you know, maximum hours laws and as uh, well, I guess it's it's still early days, but the Trump administration hasn't expressed any uh, endorsement of that opinion itself. So there, that that is one uh, big discontinuity. Um, but I, but but that is uh, not, I think, um, something that you should take as uh, defeating the the article's descriptive thesis or the analogy that it draws. Um, even though it hasn't embraced Lochner, it was on the Baker side in, uh, for example, Masterpiece Cake Shop, um, which, uh, as other uh, scholars have noted, uh, was, a, was a case that would inscribe within First Amendment law uh, some of the same Lochner-esque liberty of contract uh, protections that were earlier housed in uh, the due process clause. Um, so it's a, it's like a Lochnerism by other means um, that the Trump administration uh, sometimes embraces. But I just wanted to add too that there is another thing, which is that the the Lochner era court um, obviously embraced a, 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 a view of a powerful federal judiciary uh, that would uh, that would stand as a check to both state government action and the federal government's actions, um, and and that may also be something that uh, the Trump administration is not uh, particularly fond of. Um, in the in the Trump administration statements about the federal courts and their use of injunctive power, uh, you can see discomfort with the view of judicial power that was embraced by. Uh, the Lochner era court. Ah, uh, yes. Now that is kind of an ironic point there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and like I was saying, I mean, the the idea that there's kind of a Lochner esque quality to the way the Supreme Court has used the First Amendment, especially over the last five, ten plus years has definitely been floating around out there for a while. And I thought it was really interesting the way that your paper kind of took a step back from that very kind of targeted perspective and asked the question more generally about jurisprudence more, more broadly. And, 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 I, and I guess I wonder, like, to what extent do you think there's like predictive power associated with this observation that you make? I mean, can looking at the Trump administration through the lens of Lochner era jurisprudence and ideology help us identify bigger picture ideological potential commitments and where the administration might go in the future on other issues? Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I think it can, but you know, on the, so you know, the, this, this, the scholarship on First Amendment Lochnerism um, has been really interesting in, in how it has shown that these, you know, this, these commitments of the Lochner era court have been reemerging through other doctrinal channels, um, namely the, you know, the First Amendment, um, and, and, and have been receiving uh, support from, uh, from members of the, of the federal judiciary. So, so what I talk about in this paper shows that that phenomenon extends not just to the judiciary, but also to the executive branch. So it's not just judges that can be uh, taken with Lochner era law, it's also executive branch officials. So if you then ask, well, what might we, what might we predict from that? Um, there's, a, there's a few things I, I, I posit, and you know, it's, it's very hazardous to, to make predictions um, in the current moment, I think we can expect to see various measures adopted by the executive branch, and we could also expect to see um, shifts in 
uh, constitutional law. So on the executive branch side of it, uh, an embrace of Lochner era commitments would suggest that we should see um, antitrust enforcement. Uh, we should see the executive branch refusing to defend statutes uh, because they interfere too much with um, economic rights or they uh, interfere uh, they, or they exceed Congress's uh, powers under uh, the Commerce Clause. Um, conversely, we should be surprised to see the administration take steps to actually try to eliminate birthright citizenship, which the Lachner era court um, upheld. Um, at the Supreme Court, I think you know, we, we might expect to see a revival of the non-delegation doctrine, at least, uh, at least to some extent. That would be a reversion to the 1930s. Um, and in the recently decided case of Gandhi, the United States, we saw that the court was essentially di divided 4-4 uh, on whether to revive the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, we would also expect to see uh, the new justices appointed by this administration or future justices it appoints endorse broad views of the plenary power doctrine in immigration uh, and uh, endorse presidential power with respect to restrictions on trade. Mm. Well, so, so Mila, in, in closing, uh, you know, I, I found this a really provocative and interesting lens through which to look at the Trump administration, and, and one which honestly hadn't occurred to me until I read, until I read your paper. Um, and it struck me while I was reading it that you know, of course, the Lochner era essentially came to an end when it the court collided into the kind of supermajority of Roosevelt's new. New Deal, and we had this, you know, shift to a different kind of dominant ideological position, as as you recognized earlier in, in our conversation. And, and I guess I can't help, I couldn't help but think that, like, wow, you know, it just it struck me that a lot of people, sort of on the left today, seem to also be harking back to some of these kind of older positions. And I think of things like, you know, the people are like invoking Brandeis and the idea of bigness and wanting to return to more regulation and kind of talking more about kind of big picture programmatic social policy. I mean, do you think that maybe a similar kinds of lens makes sense for thinking about the opposition party now and what might happen going forward if there's a shift in sort of the political center of gravity? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, it's really fascinating to see how our politicians and our courts continue to just repeat the same minuets. Um, you know, it is in the time of Lochner, you, know, you had justices, the old guard, the four horsemen who were uh, trying, you know, who were most uh, strongly associated with this old vision of law. And then you had you know, newer justices, uh, Brandeis, Cardozo, Holmes, who were pushing the law towards uh, this more realist or progressive uh, vision. Um, and I'm, I'm, of course, radically uh, oversimplifying. Um, and then today, it's, it's, it is the Lochnerism or the, the Lochner-inflected vision is being advocated most strongly by the executive branch and by uh, this, uh, in the person of this president in particular. And so it's just wholly predictable and, and natural that you would then see um, its opposition, the opposition to that vision being uh, taken with these progressivist ideas uh, that, that harken back to, you know, to, to, to Brandeis. Um, so I think if, I think that we then as now have a conflict between two visions of law, um, and it will be, uh, it will play out in the current moment, um, uh, more at the ballot box, uh, than, uh, than at one first street. <laughs> great. Well, Mila, thanks so much for coming on the show. That was a really great conversation. And uh, I really enjoyed reading your paper.
Thank you, Brian. It was great to talk to you. Just a few steps up the street, turn in at the white gate, up the red brick steps and down the hall through those swinging doors, and over to that breadboard, better known as Katie's Kitchen. And here she comes, Katie Forbes. And here's a deliciously different kind of bread called crusted breadsticks. You'll need one small loaf of French bread, one half cup of melted butter, one tablespoon of Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce, and two tablespoons of sesame seeds. Cut the French bread into eight lengthwise sticks. Melt the butter and stir in the Worcestershire sauce. Then brush the sticks on all sides with the butter mixture and sprinkle with sesame seeds. Bake in a 400 degree oven for 10 to 15 minutes until brown and crusty. Wishing you the most crusty, crusted breadsticks. This has been Katie Forbes in Katie's Kitchen.